Hello and welcome to Critical Mass. This week, a drug dealer's last day of freedom in Spike Lee's film 25th Hour. A family affair in Brian Castro's novel Shanghai Dancing. And Meryl Tankard puts Hans Christian Andersen on point in Wild Swans. Joining me around the table, director Jim Sharman, dance critic for The Australian, Deborah Jones, and associate director of the Sydney Theatre Company, Stephen Armstrong. Spike Lee's new film, 25th Hour, is set in New York after September 11, and is the first to gaze solemnly at the scars. Lee often makes the city the centre of his world, memorably in the feverish films about race relations, Do the Right Thing and Malcolm X. In 25th Hour, based on a novel by David Benioff, the point of view has shifted. A white drug dealer, Monty, played by Edward Norton, is about to serve a seven-year jail sentence. He spends his last 24 hours of freedom in New York with his father and his oldest friends, a nerdish schoolteacher played by Philip Seymour Hoffman and a Wall Street cowboy, Barry Pepper. He saves his leaven for his girlfriend, who may or may not have stitched him up. I don't want you to get involved. Okay? I mean it. I'm gonna be all right. You know you'll still be a young man when you get out. I know you don't think about it, but don't start any trouble in there. Keep your head down. Don't worry about me, please. This should never have happened. You could have been... If you wanted money, you could have done anything, anything you wanted. Doctor, lawyer. Don't lay that That's on me. That's all I'm saying. Don't lay that on me. When Sal and his crew were squeezing you for the payments, I didn't hear you wishing I was a law school student then. Not one one from you back then. Where'd you think that money was coming from? Donald Trump? That was a mistake. Well, let's just forget it then. There were lots of mistakes. You should have stopped drinking when your mother passed. Oh, please. Please don't do this. An 11-year-old boy with a dead mother and a drunk father. Mm -hmm. I got no one to blame but myself. Oh, stop. 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 It wasn't you, Pop. Now, not many directors would tell this story from the point of view of a largely unrepentant drug dealer. Do you think uh, Lee has managed to pull this off, Stephen? Um, well, possibly that's why he needs the 25th hour rather than just the standard 24 um, for the character of Monty to actually kind of reckon with himself. Um, perhaps even more interesting than the fact that he's a criminal is that he's, he's actually indifferent. He's cool and he's savvy, but he's actually largely indifferent to, to the world that he lives in, excepting for his immediate circle of friends and family, his... his um, uh, his girlfriend and, and his father particularly. And um, as with most criminals and people who are as indifferent as that, he also shares a kind of a, a cool naivety, um, which I think actually uh, the rest of the city of New York in this film is portrayed as sharing as well, which is what actually makes it interesting for me. And it's only when the characters are actually really forced to the, to the point of making a moral judgment, not only about themselves, but about their relationships with others, that it really kicks in and gets interesting. And I think it's really interesting. Well, that's interesting, the, the, the sort of the parallel between the personal story and the story of the city. Um, we see Ground Zero, we see the, the, the tribute of light, but they were not in the original book, they're not in the original script, the studio didn't want them in, and yet Lee insisted on doing it. Do you think he made the right choice? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think this would have been just one of those incredibly earnest anti-crime films if you hadn't had the, the New York um, background to it. For me, the film is very much a love story to New York, and it's about how you need friendships and family and love to endure in a world that will create uh, you know, September 11. So I think without that, you would have had an incredibly ordinary film of the kind we see every day. And I'm sure that it's not a sort of film that Spike Lee would necessarily have wanted to make. So I, I, found, that, I found that whole darkness about New York uh, absolutely fascinating. And it turned the film for me into a very, um, for me, very interesting meditation about family and love and life. And, and it really, for me, was very much not about a guy going through New York spending his last day with his mates. Yeah, but didn't, didn't you find it a, a, a little bit mawkish, that whole sort of sort of patriotic spin there. But I guess, I mean, Lee makes the point that you can't make a film in contemporary New York without mentioning it. Would you, would you agree with that, Jim? Uh, yeah, well, they rubbed it out of an awful lot of films, and I think it was quite good to see one where they kept it in. Uh, I agree that it's a love story to New York. Uh, it begins with 
uh, Monty finding a maimed dog. Uh, the, it ends with Monty as a maimed dog. And uh, in a way, New York, after Osama bin Laden, is that maimed dog. I, I think that the <coughs> character um, that Edward Norton is playing is really quite unbelievable. I, I don't think we, we need to take him literally at all. I mean, he's a very likeable drug dealer. You've, you've got a friend of his saying to him, you've done all these bad things to people, you know, you're ruining their lives. And yet we see a perfectly respectable, interesting, intelligent young man who is, um, as, as, as we see, very good to animals, and we see him tossing a bit of money to a destitute man. I mean, this, this guy is not being posited to us as someone who is unlikable in any way or who is a, a, a character that we shouldn't be identifying with. So for me, it's not about the, the drug thing at all. In fact, that aspect of it, for me, was um, the most difficult to, to come to grips with. And that's why I guess I wanted to see it much more as a fantasy. Um, for me, it was a fantasy from beginning to end because of that, that reason. Right, it's a fairly muted film for Spike Lee, but he, I mean, he does have these sort of occasional Spike Lee touches. Uh, the, the rant into the mirror where he tries to blame everyone else yeah, but that, himself. I thought that was fantastic. And, and, and it begins, actually, in the opening sequence, those extraordinary blue lights, which are you know, the memorial to the buildings that, that have now gone. Um, are bent at one point. I mean, I, I think that in fact um, Lee's offering us the opportunity to actually experience the whole film as parody and I think that comes uh, really to a head at that moment where Monty goes to the bathroom and he sees the words expletive you and he then goes well who's to blame for this you know what is this city that i'm living in what is it that i'm in, lo in love with what is the city that is in that has allowed me to be who i am um and without ever questioning me and so he then goes on to this fantastic rap which <laughs> which is a, a caustic abusive um kind of denigration of every ethnic group and kind of you know subcult of of new york but then, of course, at the end, he has to subvert that because he is no less a part of, of that world than, than what he's describing. And it's a, I thought it was a really kind of quite um, profound moment of epiphany for him. Mm. But um, that kind of aria of self-loathing uh, is also a little bit of an echo of Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver. And in fact, the film is, is riddled with kind of references to other films. The two that came to mind, just picking up on Deborah's point there, uh, were The Third Man, um, we have got Vienna and the drug dealer, except in that one you do see the victims. Uh, and the other one is uh, Daniel Aronofsky's Requiem for a Dream, which if you're talking about drugs, is a film that leaves this one at the starting gate. Yeah. Well, let's have a look at, from the film uh, at the moment. Uh, we see Edward Norton as Monty being bailed up about his girlfriend, who may or may not have sold him out. I'll be there, for Christ's sake. Tell him. I'm bringing some friends. I'm bringing Naturel. Monty, wait, Monty, please. Why you bring her? Why wouldn't I? You have this discussion once before, no? You get very mad at me. Oh, you know what? Can you stop with that already? I already told you it wasn't her. Well, you know this. Why would she? Maybe her aunt is a legal alien. You know these Mexicans, they hey, jump the hey, border. Hey, hey, Puerto Rican. Makes her a citizen of the United States. That's more than I can say for you. Maybe the feds, they, they bust the... Feds, the... you know, you're cracking up. Fill in my head with this shit. You're crazy. You ask her. No, I didn't ask her. Listen, before you leave, you should know. See down there. Hmm. Now, interestingly enough, that large chap whose name escapes me for the moment, that's the first time he's ever acted. Uh, he was, I think he was a professional footballer before that. Yes. Uh, but Edward Norton, of course, has done other films. Uh, did, were you impressed with Mr Norton? Well, I find him quite cute, so that's probably affected my response to him. I think there's a very flat kind of affectless acting style going on in, um, in, in this film, which perhaps would, would make some people think that he's not acting very well. I, I actually think he's, he's quite a fine actor, but again, I think it's part of this film where we see him very much being acted upon in, in this last 24 hours. He's not really doing very much except going through the paces of saying goodbye to people and, uh, and trying to come to terms, I think as, as Stephen was saying, um, come to terms with himself and, and the city that he lives in. I, I was interested when, when you were saying that it, uh, that it, it seemed quite, uh, quite sentimental. And yet that's 
for me a power of, of the film that at the end that after you've had a rant and a rave against all of the people who make up New York and all of the things that they do to irritate you and, and to make your life miserable and difficult and then at the end you see these same faces again and you have to look at them and say these are me, these are my fellows, they live in this city with me, they've survived in this city with me and, and I found that extremely powerful and, and, and so that, that was the, the fact that we had this kind of flat acting style from Edward Norton didn't bother me. Well that made it really not so much a film about uh, drugs or the city but maybe a meditation on friendship and something of a redemption song. And what, wasn't the dialogue fantastic, those friendship and, the, and very the funny. Moments of debate Although, did you also things. think maybe it was kind of so busy being an ensemble piece for the actors mm. that it kind of got a little caught up with that and that kind of slowed the pace? Well, there's obviously something for everyone in this film, I think. You can see it as parody, you can see it as a tribute to New York, or you can just go along because Edward Norton is cute. <laughs> anyway, it screens nationally. Meryl Tankett's career has swung between extremes. She's danced for the celebrated avant-garde choreographer Pina Bausch, and for the Olympic Games opening ceremony, she shot Nicky Webster out of a jellyfish. Unfortunately, that didn't deter Nicky Webster, who went on to greater things. Kitty Pop. Wild Swans, however, is Tankard's first full-length work choreographed for the Australian Ballet. It's a retelling of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy story, in collaboration with the costume designer of Moulin Rouge, Angus Strathy, and the composer, Eleanor Katz-Chernan. Silhouettes and cut-out paper dolls slip between the seams of this fantastical tale. I get inspired by what Meryl does. I get inspired when I see the dancers move to my music, and I also get inspired when I see that they actually get moved by the music, mm. or mm. even by the mm. pauses. Mm. Sometimes mm. I put pauses mm. in, and they, and they just come do to a little me. hand gesture because she would play a little lighter, you know. Now I see it in my head. I, when I went to Elena's, I used to see the whole scene and I thought, oh, that's great now. If I could just transfer what was there <laughs> into 26 dancers and technical crew, it would be really easy. But <laughs> it's so many elements, you know, not only the music, there's so many strange elements with the flying and the visual images that it's now bringing them all together. Deborah, Meryl Tankard is a major choreographer. Is this a major work? Unfortunately, very much not. Uh, as you can see fr from the, the clip, uh, it looks fantastic. It looks absolutely wonderful, but dramatically and emotionally, it's as flat as a tack. Now, I think uh, when Tankard was talking about uh, translating Elena Katz-Chernan's music into choreography, I mean, she just wasn't able to do that. Uh, and that was such a disappointment because obviously you've got these wonderful surroundings in, in Wild Swans. You've got Angus Strathy's costumes, which are, are quite brilliant and very, 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 very witty. You've got this terrific music. You've got a story that should resonate. I mean, the reason that, that fairy tales survive is because we find something in them, something powerful and something human in them. And then what we end up with is a whole bunch of cardboard cutouts. Very disappointing. Jim, were you equally disappointed or was there more light at the end of the I don't know who could you. possibly say uh, something like that about anything that has dancing doilies in it. <laughs> um, <coughs> I, uh, I actually went and saw it after reading Deborah's review, which was uh, expressing similar emotions. I had a great night. Uh, and one of the great pleasures of it was actually being witness to the beginning of what is a fantastic collaboration between a choreographer and a composer with Meryl Tankard and Eleanor Katz-Chernan and the audience I was with agreed, it, uh, agreed with me, I think. They gave it a standing ovation and also picked up on the one thing that I don't think Deborah has perhaps picked up on, which is a sense of playfulness, which perhaps comes uh, a little surprisingly from a choreographer like Meryl who's done great works like Furioso and so forth uh, in, the, in the past but I love the playfulness of it and uh, while I had one or two reservations which we might get to uh, I had a fantastic night at Wild Swans. Well you said something interesting there you said the beginning of uh, the collaboration I, I must have been I felt the, the whole thing was a little undercooked as if they'd almost run out of time do you think it was uh, Stephen it had got to a point of preparedness where it was a complete work? Um, I, I didn't feel uh, uh, any doubt at all that Elena and um, the designers had actually achieved what they'd set out to do. I thought it was a very accomplished uh, collaboration. The question of whether the piece uh, survived or exceeded the story um, is, is where I'm still kind of sitting on the, on the fence. 
um, I think if you take a, a children's tale where the child is the central uh, character and we're identifying with the child, then we as adults need to somehow kind of be able to experience a child's fear. And I felt that the design and the music really did uh, assist me to go on, on that journey. But I wasn't familiar with the story. Um, and so there were, there were moments of great confusion for me where, I, where the power of, of the, the child's journey was um, kind of depleted. Um, and where what was going on on stage might have been fascinating me, but it wasn't actually mm. engaging me. I think, yeah, dr dramaturgically, but it's actually not very strong. It, it needed another eye to get in there and say, what is this story that you're trying to tell us? You know, when Eliza goes to pick nettles to knit them into, into a pullover, can we tell that that's what she's doing? I'm afraid the answer was no. She looked like she was doing a little bit of light weeding. Well, I didn't have too many problems with the nettles, but I actually do agree with this point, that it seemed to me that actually at the end, where suddenly we got a whole lot of divertissements that took us away from the story, uh, which was actually staged in a way that certainly didn't live up to the fabulousness of uh, Eliza flying through the air and so forth, that perhaps uh, there'd be a little bit of running out of time and running out of budget. But look, I just think it's fantastic that the Sydney Opera House has committed this got Merrill happening, got this work there with the Australian Ballet. For me, it Touché. is a near classic, mm. but it needs, uh, mm. I think it does need work, and possibly what it needs is a dramaturg. It certainly needs a dramaturg. I think it needs a, a lot of attention paid to, though, to the choreography. Uh, for me, uh, there was far too much teetering around on point, for example, and for me, a huge, huge flaw in the work is that you've got 11 beautiful young men who are turned into swans, and I don't think you can tell that they're swans. No. Well, I think you're blind. <laughs> no, well, I wouldn't have thought that pedal pushes denoted swan. It doesn't say it to me. I wasn't sure that it mattered whether they were swans or what they were. What it's, was clear was that they... But it's essential to the story, Stephen. They, 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 they were out on a whole sort of mythic element. I thought they were great clumpy swans. I thought they were just <laughs> terrific. The thing that I, I was most impressed by, and it's something you don't often hear, is a fully composed two-act orchestral mm -hmm. score. I thought the score was brilliant. It was fantastic. It is beautiful. It was it fantastic. And the other thing that I got an echo of, and, and kind of just gave me a little kind of added bonus was was that kind of sense of it. Uh, I, I thought we were back with the Ballet Russe and um, Diaghilev and uh, that world particularly when we got, you know, Hungarian wedding guests with cute hats and, as I said, the dancing doilies, glow worms. I mean, I, I just was, uh, m maybe I'm a sucker for it, but I was just charmed by it. I look, I love the fact that you loved it. Jim, I think that's it's wonderful that someone you know is, is as passionate. Well, there's actually about a thousand of us there. That yeah, did. and that's and that, really, and that is really great. But I suppose I'm looking at it from very much um, you know from the you know the ballet structure point of view. At the end, when we have all these little divots, what they what they do is they echo the 19th century classical ballet after you've had the wedding, and you have your prince and princess up on their you know in their, in their lovely big thrones, and sure. everyone comes on and they they celebrate. Now that's what it's mimicking, but you couldn't even tell who the prince and princess where they were shoved off to one side I didn't care anymore about them and that worries me intensely if I come to see a story ballet that's based on something that that is supposed to make me feel passionate about life love whatever and and about sacrifice and about family feeling and all of the things that the story is about and at the end I couldn't ending, care yeah. less about, mm, but about, it was about the end people. endings are important but it was one scene and it didn't for me detract mm. from an otherwise fantastic creation well indeed I think in summary you would have to say that failure or not the attempt was more than worth the effort. Much more. Wild Swans is playing at the State Theatre in Melbourne until the 17th of June. With a swag of major Australian literary awards under his belt, Brian Castro has critical recognition, but not the profile that perhaps he should. Shanghai Dancing, his eighth and most autobiographical novel, is a big jostling book that veers across characters and centuries. The narrator, Antonio Castro, is a writer and displaced soul who tries to make sense of his tumultuous family history. The twists and turns of memory take him to Hong Kong and Macau, but the novel comes into focus in his parent Shanghai, the city of playboys, beautiful women and family secrets. This tale's been lurking at the back of my mind for some time, for 30 years actually, and I didn't feel write about writing it until the moment arrived where I could join up uh, my distance from my personal experiences with a suitable style. I survived 40 years in Australia. My mind was never right. Time went by. Then I got the urge to return to China, to those rising and falling cities, now and then uncovered by the tide of memory. 
to pursue the emptiness of things disappearing all around. One day, feeling extremely strange after a brisk walk in the rain with my dog along the complex trails behind my cabin in the mountains, I packed a suitcase and walked out of my marriage and my life forever. I experienced an ataraxia, which they say is the tranquility of God. Well, Stephen, in just over 400 pages, the sweep of the novel is very impressive. Do you think uh, Brian Castro has pulled this one off? I do. I really admired this, this work. Um, uh, perhaps 380 pages might have done, but for 400 pages, I, I was with it the whole way. Um, I think what's most exciting about it is that he really arrests language and he he acknowledges that words can both create and destroy and he's setting out to create an existence for himself to actually give himself an identity to make him in fact lovable um, because who can be loved if they don't actually exist and there's one point in the, the novel where he says I rarely use the word love and when I do I cease to exist and it seems to me that that's his quest and so it becomes a duel uh, between truth and, and meaning and uh, words and language and of course the languages of many cultures and many times and the fact that we we have within ourselves the language that we speak and each of the languages that we use have within themselves the roots of other languages so there's this fantastic kind of uh, kind of elliptical kind of story happening across time, across geography, across idea, and I was really engaged. Uh, he mentioned there that he, he had to search for the right style to write this story. Do you think he has actually found the right style? Uh, yes, I do. I think it's a fantastic uh, novel, uh, and I think it unfolds like a Chinese screen. Uh, uh, as a comparison, it's like listening to a Mahler symphony where you get a kind of, you know, vast length, uh, vast climaxes, funny bits, the town band going by, bits that you get a little bit bored by, etc. I did find in reading it that when, uh, <coughs> I think there's, we've got such a history of, uh, uh, of our own uh, culture being seen in terms of European origins and narrative stories, <coughs> that if you actually read it as a narrative story you become enormously impatient with it but if you start reading it kind of as you might look at the panels of a Chinese screen mm. taking a break between each one the episodes finally uh, kind of build up to this enormous uh, climax at the end which I which I found uh, greatly moving I actually thought it was fabulous in the sense of fable uh, but I thought that fabulous was also uh, given a great deal of depth by it being understand uh, under under there was an undertow of what the, the narrator calls the embarrassment of despair. Uh, I, I certainly feel like when I'm walking down the streets of Australia and I see all of these faces uh, and I imagine the kind of histories that are behind them. Only once before have I felt in a book uh, some explanation of that and that was in uh, Patrick White's Riders in the Chariot where the effect of the Holocaust on, on Jewish Australians was brought to, I, I think the effect of the Nanking Massacre on Chinese mm. Australia in this was just sensationally rendered. Yes, I mean, that's an interesting way of looking at it because it, uh, one of the problems I found with the, with the book was the, the lack of a narrative thrust. Do you think, Deborah, perhaps he, he could have done with a more ruthless editor? Well, yes, I very much think that. I felt as if I'd been hit over the head with a blunt instrument, I have to say, when, it, when I was reading it, the blunt instrument being, it's, four, it's not just over 400 pages, it's 450, 450. It's, four. it's, it's a lot and of pages. Tiny print. <laughs> a few photos, though. That takes out a couple the, the, of words. A, a few. Look, I, I appreciate but what both Stephen and, and Jim are saying, but I found that lack of, of narrative drive difficult for me. I felt I was drowning in detail. I didn't know whether I was in Shanghai or Macau. I didn't know what generation I was with. Uh, I, I, d I needed more signposts through it because, you know, he is telling of a fascinating time and of fascinating people and, and, and the war scenes are, are brilliant, the, yes. the internment scenes are very, very affecting and striking. But I felt I was just wallowing and drowning and, and not led closely enough through the labyrinth so that well, I could far, appreciate Far be it for me yet again, Deborah, to, to explain <laughs> to you how to read something. Um, but uh, actually, if you oh, had a read it episode by episode, rather than trying to turn it into something that it wasn't, maybe you would have had a slightly different experience. Well, I found it uh, so confusing at times. I mean, I think Chinese puzzle might be a more useful analogy than a Chinese screen. Uh, I found myself having to constantly refer back to the family tree, which he very conveniently printed at the beginning of the book, to work out who was who. Yeah, that, yeah, I, I'm yeah, with you on that. 
Yes. But he's obviously worked at it for quite a while, I would venture. Oh, I'm sure uh, he has. Uh, 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 I think it's, 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 it's a banquet in an age of fast food. I mean, I think we do read things because there's a kind of deadline to read them but now. But that's true. But uh, and I don't think that's the way this book is to be read. And in that sense, I, I, I would certainly say that this book is not for everyone. This is a really experiential piece of writing. It's not about starting at A and finishing at Z. It's about actually experiencing what he's talking about and the, and the big ideas that he's talking mm. about, which is why you get repeated motifs, why whole passages are repeated in different sections of the novel and have a completely different resonance depending on at what, at what point you're coming at it from. Uh, a rich tapestry indeed, but I'm afraid we must stop contemplating it there. Shanghai Dancing is published by Giramondo Press. Thanks to the panel, Stephen Armstrong, Deborah Jones and Jim Sharman, who are shortly seeking counselling. Next week, the Sydney Dance Company's new work, Underland, the film adaptation of best-selling novel Balzac and the Little Chinese Seamstress, and the variety show is dusted off in McAuliffe tonight. For more information about Critical Mass, go to our website, abc.net.au forward slash Sunday afternoon. See you next week.